welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man whose only holiday wish is to receive a fax this Wednesday, informing him that he is fired, Mr. Lauren Baumgarten. Lauren! <laughs> What's up, Fred Adams? And why would you want to receive a fax on Wednesday in I'm not sure. You? I'm, tr- I'm trying fired. to think. Why would you want? I'm trying that? to think what happens. On, I'm trying to think what happens on Thursday. I know what happens on Friday. But what happens, what happens on, on th- Wednesday is Doc Brown and Marty come to the future from 1985. Oh my God! And it would be it would be the perfect Back to the Future tie-in if Lauren Baumgarten. One of the few people in North America to still own a fax machine received a "You're Fired" fax, just like Marty of the Future. I guess if you've never seen the Back to the Future trilogy, I have just spoiled a big. I mean, like that is the crucial. I mean, like that's basically you know Darth Vader telling Luke, "I am your father" in Empire Strikes Back. That is how big a moment that is in Back to the Future is, Two. Is it the twenty first? It is. It's October the twenty first, two thousand and fifteen. For some reason, I thought it was the twentieth. In two days, uh, two days from that's right. From right yeah, now. that's right. So it's. I mean, as if it hasn't already been a big Back to the Future kind of month. It's going to be a big Back to the Future kind of week. Let me tell you. That uh, that is, is a true story. That that's true. I would like it that. And our first story, Brent. It's almost like we planned this. It's almost like we planned this. Our, our first story. We have a lot of garage this week, Brett. We're doing. A we're trying to be fast and loose garage. with the show. We're trying to let it sort of, you know, sort of play out uh, it's naturally. Insane. That's right. And so this week we didn't really have a clubhouse topic necessarily. Nothing jumped out at you and I. So we're doing. Uh, but but there was like fifteen of these, or not making that up. But there were a lot of stories <laughs> in the garage. So we're going to be spending a lot of time in the garage this week. Uh, starting off with. Something that I just think is, could not be doper, uh, and that is uh, Rocket League put out a video, a, a teaser, for their Back to the Future car pack. It's almost as if they knew we were going to need an intro this week and decided to supply us with the ammunition as the leaping off point. Yeah, so Rocket League's getting the fucking flying DeLorean. I mean, as if, as if Rocket League couldn't get any better, they got a fucking flying DeLorean. Yeah, uh, I don't even I, I don't even know what to say. I just thought it was the coolest thing ever, and it will very likely get me back into Rocket League for a little while. Right now, I'm like, okay. I mean, I guess you're Back to the Future fans. You like the Flying DeLorean, but I mean, if they really, really wanted to prove themselves to me, they would have referees on hoverboards, and then also, also, uh, all of the scores this week would get jacked on account of, of, of some jackass with a sports almanac somewhere, betting successfully on all the matches. That's right. Uh, I'm very excited for this, Brent. Can't wait to see it play out. I have a feeling there will be people buying it from this very website. Um, something else I imagine people, people picking up this week is the new GTA Online DLC Lowriders. Uh, GTA Online Lowriders is going to add a whole bunch of new content to GTA Online. GTA Online, including, as the name might suggest, the ability to customize your ride. You can throw in customized engine blocks, velour, leather, and other velour. kinds of inter- interiors, <laughs> uh, custom air filters. You can uh, you can actually install hydraulics and rims and custom steering wheels and shift levers. All the kinds of things that your your car modder would uh, would want to would want to get their hands on. And then in addition to all of that, uh, Lamar, who remains one of my favorite characters in GTA V, uh, is going to dole out a whole host of new missions, uh, which I guess is connected to, you know, to him sort of you know, climbing the, uh, the criminal food chain. Uh, anyway, you'll also uh, get new weapons. There's a new machete and a full auto machine pistol you can pick up from Ammunition, and that is going to go live today, the day you're listening to this, October the 20th. So... Playing. And Brent, how much uh, how much will this set you back? Free. Oh yes, that's going to tie into our actually to our uh, into the sunset as well this week. But this is pretty cool. GTA still manages uh, to look just awesome, and I'm sure that there are a lot of um, latent vatos out there that are going to be very excited about this. Yep, this is good times. Uh, good times with friends and guns. Speaking of good times with friends and guns. Uh, <laughs> Oh no! Wait, that's this the wrong is song. actually kind of this is actually kind of an old story. It seems like this actually broke last week 
shortly after we after we recorded. I can't I can't remember. Yeah, it, but, it did. But it anyway, did. that's true. Uh, it's a true story. EA has revealed and detailed all of the multiplayer modes yes. that are going to be part yes, of they did. Star Wars Battlefront. Of course, we got it's true that they did that. a look at three of those during the the beta. But we now know well two two multiplayer modes okay, and then yeah, one single right, player. Well, yeah, you know two multiplayer well, modes and one co op mode. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. But now we've got a look at all of the uh, all of the the nine game modes that, that yeah, we nine knew of them. That, yeah. the, that Battlefront was going to have. So we've got yeah. Fighter Squadron uh, where you take to the skies, and by the sky we literally mean the skies, not not space. The uh, EA, yes. EA wants to really make sure you understand you are not going into space in these motherfucking spaceships. But anyway, Fighter Squadron, uh, you're going to dogfight in X-Wings, TIE Fighters, the Millennium Falcon's going to make an appearance. You've got Supremacy, Rebels and Imperials fight for control of five key points in a 20-on-20 clash. This is going to be some of the biggest maps in Battlefront, they say. You've got Cargo, uh, a thrilling tug-of-war experience for Capture the Flag fans. Uh, Cargo challenges your team to capture cargo boxes from the opposing team and get the loot back to your own base. You've got Droid Runs, uh, excuse me, you've got Droid Run, which is a six-on-six fight to capture and hold on to three of the Gonk Droids. You've got the uh, the Walker Assault, which was in the beta. You've got Blast, which is a classic team deathmatch, 10-on-10. 10 10. Drop Zone, which was in the beta. Then you've got right. Heroes versus Villains, which uh, is a, a mixture of the heroes that we know are going to be in the game, like Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, Boba Fett. And your team has got to try to keep your hero alive. And then sort of on the other side of that, there's also a hero hunt mode where you're going to have seven players going after one hero. So as an example, like seven Imperials going after Luke Skywalker, one lucky person gets to be Luke Skywalker and all seven people are trying to, uh, to get him. So if you want to be Luke, then you have to take out Luke and then you become the hero. But then of course, everybody's hunting you. So that's it. Very similar to what Riddick did a while ago. Yeah, yeah. W- which, yeah. which I thought was. I mean, honestly, that that's probably about as good a. That's probably about about as good a game mode for uh, at least that style for for Battlefront as one could hope for, as far as incorporating yep. you know those iconic characters. But anyway, so are you buying it, Brent? You know, I, I I'm leaning towards yes right now. I still have not made a decision, <laughs> but I am leaning towards yes. So I had the conversation with my friends. So it, there was, a, I can't remember if it was Green Man Gaming or where. It was on sale for 45 bucks. Mm-hmm. Um, and we called each other and we were like, so 45 bucks, I don't know, should we do it? And my buddy was like, you know what? Battlefield 3, Battlefield 4, if you said 45 bucks, like I wouldn't have even hesitated for a second. And just the fact that we're talking about this tells me that maybe it's not right for us. And so I think we're going to hold off. I know, like, Everybody and their mother is like super annoyed by their stupid fucking fifty dollars season pass uh, that they're offering, mm-hmm. um, which you can only get actually it right now uh, if you buy it as the digital deluxe supreme deluxe ass edition. Yes. Which like there's like the regular edition sixty bucks. You pay ten bucks more and get some stupid digital shit for sixty nine ninety nine. And then if you want the season pass, you have to buy the supreme version, which is a set, which is one nineteen ninety nine. Yep. So you, right now you can't opt out of the ten dollar digital bullshit pack, as far as I know. Now I don't know if you can buy the season. I don't know if ultimately I'm sure you'll be able to buy it separately, but yeah. who knows? But either way, I mean, it's not. If, if, I, don't if know. I got it at this point, I would just get the base game. I wouldn't get anything additional. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, as, I don't, think we're, I don't think we're getting it. it. I don't think we're getting it right off the bat. But I have to say, like, you know, people talk about not much content or whatever. The, the nine modes, and you know what I. Th- What's going to be how many maps to start off with? It's four planets, but I would assume, you know, at probably 10 maps. I can't remember. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, that seems like a reasonable amount of content to me. I agree. I, I don't know. It, it really, it, to me, it really felt like people were kind of judging the game by the beta, which is. I don't I, a slice that you. I mean, I played yeah, Battlefield I mean, Four. I got I got played the Battlefield Four beta, and I got very sick of playing. It's it. a piece. It's a it's a piece of the game, but it's not the full thing. And I. I, I don't know. I kind of agree with you. I'll be interested to see what people think about the full game once it comes out. Once it's out. Yep. Which is, of course, on November 17th, just yep. so that we mention that on PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Uh, yeah, I feel like there's a couple other games coming out around that time. <laughs> yeah, possibly. So, Fallout 4. 
Oh, the, maybe that's one of them. The Fallout 4 Pip Boy Edition, which Her. they showed off to many standing ovations <laughs> during the Bethesda yeah, E3 is... event. Uh, it's back in stock. And wait, of course. You, wait, 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 Lauren. <laughs> do we have an update on this? Update. It's out of stock again. Oh, oh no! <laughs> that quickly. That yes. quickly. Yeah. So for a few short hours today, the Bethesda store did have the uh, the Pip Boy edition <laughs> back in stock. And uh, and now they don't. And it's gone again. <laughs> Apparently, Bethesda really, really hit one out of the park. With this Pip Boy edition, I remember how excited we were when we saw it. Sh- uh, saw it at E3. Yeah. They, they yeah. showed off the uh, the hundred and twenty dollar, I mean, which really, I mean, it's basically the game and then an actual plastic Pip Boy that Pip you can Boy. <laughs> right. turn your That's smartphone right. into. I, I mean, like honestly, I, I I would never have imagined that it it was this insanely popular. So good for them, and good for everybody who managed to get in on it and get their own Pip Boy edition. I really, I really kind of wanted to have one, and at the same time, I just couldn't bring myself to pull the trigger on it. It's just, it's a lot of money for, it's a lot of money for what essentially I could strap to my hand using duct tape. It, it, it is, and, and uh, if they come out with it again, it's going to sell out again. I'm trying to remember like how quickly they sold out the first time around. I mean, it, it was, it was pretty fast. And well, and then they announced it like, okay, that's it. Like, like our supplier literally cannot make any more of these. Like, it's done. And then they said, okay, well, you know, we're going to be able to do like a small amount of, of others. I mean, it's just, I'm trying to decide. I basically what I'm saying here is, I'm trying to decide, is Bethesda fucking with us on this? Like, like that's, are, are they legitimately hitting supply chain issues, or are they just fucking with us? Are they pulling a Nintendo and keeping them in short supply? To make it seem like Fallout 4 is going to be the biggest selling game of the year. I don't know. I mean, it's Fallout 4. It's probably going to be the biggest selling game of the year. They probably don't need to do this to help that along, do they? No, probably not. I'm going to go with no. Mm. All right. Speaking now, Brent, speaking of Fallout 4, this next, day, this next story I think is uh, super dope. Uh, and that is that they have announced that Fallout 4 will have PlayStation Vita. It's not going to be available on the Vita, like you could buy it on the Vita. Yeah, which would be But they're cool. going to have PlayStation... It would be, but they're going to have remote play-specific controls. So they're really designing Fallout 4 uh, to be played on remote play. And I just I just think that's the coolest thing ever, man. I know they did it... Like, Destiny had that. Yep. Um, I, I just think that's awesome. You and I talked about... Like, my one of my big use cases for something like the Vita is to be able to, like, play it for an hour or two... Mm-hmm. And then potentially like go lay down in bed and keep playing it, and I just I just think that's awesome. Yeah, the last thing that I I did remote play on the Vita was Lorecroft and the Temple of Osiris. Yeah, and it was that's a game that I would think would play pretty well. It did. It, it played really well. It's got reasonably simple controls. It does utilize the rear touch screen or the touch pad on the rear, and it it works reasonably well. It's it's there's definitely just a slight amount of lag to it. You have to you have to be conscious of the fact that it's not going to be quite as real-time as using the controller, but it was completely playable, and it was a very fun experience, exactly like what you're describing, just playing on the TV, and it's like, ah, you know, time to, time to go to bed, I'll play for another half hour before I go to sleep. It, it's, it's a great experience, and for me, that is the biggest, that's the biggest use case that I can kind of think of as far as the Vita goes, although I did... Uh, I was thinking the other night that I might I might give Metal Gear Solid Five a go with remote play. I'll, I'll be just just curious to see how it kind of works because it does have a slightly more complicated control. Uh, is it layout. is it also designed? No, it is, as far as I know, it's not designed. So you know, it would just gotcha. be using kind of like the default, right, right. Uh, the the default control scheme, the the generic one. But I would be curious to see how it would feel and how it would work. And it, it could be something interesting, given the fact that, you know, I could sit there and play that on the couch while my daughter is, you know, watching one of her, one of her kids shows on Netflix that I've already seen 300 times anyway, but <laughs> that, uh, that might be interesting, but yeah, I, I, I mean, give it up to Bethesda. I think this is a great idea. It definitely is a cool thing. If you happen to be on the PlayStation four and have the Vita, it's, it's a cool value add for those players. So good on them. More to the point. I think it just shows the people over at Bethesda are like, what is some cool ass shit we could do with Fallout Four? Like, yep. like really thinking like from a gamer perspective, which is which is cool. They could try making it a good game because I'm sure it's going to suck. 
Somebody else that's having a little bit of uh, a little bit of problem right now is Valve. Valve is having just a little bit of trouble with eh. the launch of the uh, the Steam controller and the Steam Link. Well, I don't I don't know that the Steam Link actually has that uh, that much of a of an issue at the moment. But the Steam controller, nah, getting such great reviews from people who have gotten their hands on it recently. Uh, over on the Mac side of things, because for one specific reason, uh, th- this is true. Over on the Mac side yeah. of things. Uh, where of course Steam has made inroads and uh, and Mac actually has a really great complement of Steam games or of of games now uh, courtesy of Steam. However, the Steam Link and Steam Controller are currently not compatible on the Mac OS. Uh, a rather, despite the fact that some of you Mac users up there may have already pre-ordered. Yes, it. <laughs> yes, and and only to only to discover that uh, it's going to do you jack and shit. But Valve does have a a solution incoming. They are working on the compatibility issues. They're going to get it sorted. And as a way of an apology, they're giving you every Valve game ever. Now and in the future. Yes, you heard me correct. You are going to get the 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 Valve complete pack, essentially, which they ordinarily sell for a hundred bucks. And it includes all Valve-made games, present and future, uh, as an apology for the Steam Link and Steam Controller not working right now on the Mac platform. So I have to say that while it certainly seems like, since Valve's made such a big deal about gaming on the Mac and and, and they went through all the trouble of porting their games over and, and they've encouraged developers to make games available on the Mac and so on and so forth. It seems like it would have been a priority enough that the damn thing would have worked the day that they released it. Well, which I guess technically they haven't actually uh, launched yet. It's November the 10th, but anyway, I would have, I would have thought that they would have made this a priority to get it done. But in, in lieu of that, I have to say that I think that giving away all their games ever is actually, (laughs) it's, it's actually a pretty, a pretty good gesture. Of course, <laughs> that ignores the fact that you probably already own all these games because you picked them up for seventy-five cents a piece during one of the Steam sales. And if they give them to you, it's not like you can play them on the TV you wanted to play them on. <laughs> uh, no, I I agree with you, Brent. That it is, well, I, I'm curious what the future games are. Like, is it every future game ever? Is Valve telling it do, it you that? It doesn't matter because it's going to be Half Life Three, and that's the only one that right. really matters. Right. Especially with uh, the or is, they're giving you Half Life oh, Three. Or is Valve saying to you, "We're never making any more games"? So, ah, <laughs> fuck you. Uh, yeah, and this is a this is a pretty awesome. Like, uh, I mean, especially if you don't have a lot of their games, it's a pretty awesome gift for screwing up. And, and as you said, of course, the refund as well. But uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, it sucks. It totally sucks. I I, I feel for Mac um, gamers, but. All right, stop right no, there. I you mean, don't give a shit about Mac gamers. So, I mean, well, I mean, hey, man, I was I was a Mac tech for a long time, and and it's just it's just it's if you're a gamer on the computer, Mac isn't the best choice. Not at the moment. I mean, I feel, but it, it's just it's just it hasn't been Although for. It's a lot better thanks to Valve. Since Oregon Trail on the two C, it pretty much hasn't been the platform of choice from a <laughs> computer standpoint. I mean, really. Uh, speaking of gaming on the PC, Brent. Yes. And speaking of Valve, yes. this, this is interesting. Right. So we have another Valve story, and it's about the Steam controller. Uh, there's a story on PC Gamer this last week that talks about how Valve wants gamers to improve the Steam controller design, yeah. which I think is awesome. They basically said, yeah, like, considering look, considering they been, really need to. It's, <laughs> they've said, look, we've been playing around this for like two years, and we expect we gamers to improve. It out. We expect gamers to improve upon it. This is not the last iteration of this. Uh, and if they if uh, gamers weren't to improve upon it, it would be the first product of ours that they haven't. And I think that's awesome. But what it also does, Brent, is it makes me not want to buy it. Yes, I agree with because you. Because I feel like they're going to improve it six or nine months from now and have a better version. I will have paid 50 bucks for it, and I'm going to be pissed that I'm stuck with the old version. Well, I, I remain really interested in the Steam Link. I, I really like... The idea me too, very much. Link, I mean, but I'll happily me use it with a fucking 360 controller, or you know, whatever, w- whatever else I might be able to plug up to. But I have to say that I've, having read some firsthand accounts and and some of the specific things that people are talking about, which is that the the shape of the grips on the controller actually moves the it actually moves the buttons and the pads kind of away from you. We have to sort of like reach down into into a recess, essentially. 
to get to the face buttons and things like that. Just it sounds like some of the things that they're describing. I, I don't think that I don't think I would like. And you know, just even like the really simple stuff, like they talk about how the the, the size of the buttons, like the X Y A B buttons, are smaller than what you'd expect to have on a controller, like fifteen percent or something, but a notice a noticeable amount. Just simple things like that. I don't know. It seems to me that it seems to me that with that and the way that they're talking about wanting gamers to help them improve, it's like, yeah, I'll help you improve it by not buying it. Fix it and then yeah. I'll pay for it. But yeah, I, I kind of feel I'm the same boat. I'm not interested in buying something that is is half baked, which is what this is. All right. Yeah, that's how it feels to me too. And I also have a wire. I didn't even realize till you just said it that I could use my wired Xbox 360 controller. Which I still, I mean, I still love the Xbox 360 controller. Me too. And I'm happy that one I bought for my PC has plenty long cord for me. You know, the games that the thing I want to use the Steam Link for is to be able to play the games that are um, TV friendly. TV friendly, yeah. Like I'd play an Assassin's Creed game, or you know, Splinter Cell, like a third person stealth game, or even you know, Metal Gear Solid or whatever. I still have no interest in trying to play Battlefield 4 or Titanfall on the TV. Using a controller that's supposed to emulate the the accuracy of the the keyboard and mouse, I'd rather use the keyboard and mouse for those yeah. games. And so I'm perfectly fine using. I didn't realize the wired Xbox 360 controller would work, and now I'm even more encouraged to buy the Steam Link. Yeah, I, I read a I read a, a first uh, a first impression, you know, a hands on first impression using the the Steam Link with the controller, and they were talking about they were talking about using. Two Steam Steam controllers and then a 360 controller, and they were having some problems. Like he kept wanting to, basically wanting to assign the 360 controller as like the player one controller, even though that should have been one of the one of the Steam controllers. And you know, just just right. all kinds of of little issues like that. I mean, that's just that's basically just you know software stuff that might need to get tweaked with an update or something. But and, and that that's all fine. You know, like those kinds of things would not necessarily scare me off but just hearing the consistently negative reviews about the shape of the controller and just how the they don't feel that valve has really accomplished what they set out to do with the controller which was to make a controller that would that would emulate the the precision of mouse and keyboard and that they have not succeeded on on that and I, I guess right. that's that's the thing for me is that I feel like if the controller shape was was not good, if the buttons were too small, and and you put this thing in your hands like wow, it, it really feels weird and and not at all like the controllers that I'm used to. But when you use the the the, the thumb pads and you get everything dialed in just right, it's amazing. Like it's a transformative experience. And you just wouldn't believe the kind of things that you can pull off. You'd never imagine a controller can do the things this can do. If I was reading those kinds of things, then I would feel, I would feel a lot more. I, I still don't know that I would necessarily buy one, but I would at least feel like Valve was gonna. They were gonna nail this down. Like on the next iteration, they were gonna change the shape, make the buttons bigger, whatever. Right. But it just seems like the fundamental thing the controller was supposed to do has not happened. And so, I don't know, like, at this point, I'm just starting to wonder if the whole thing is just a wash. Yeah, I, 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 get, I mean, that re- obviously remains to be seen as they iterate on it, yeah. uh, which is why I won't buy it. Yeah, well, and I, 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 not- guess that I, don't, I guess I don't begrudge them for... I don't know. I, I don't begrudge them for trying, but there is just something no, no, slightly... No, but do you think- there is something slightly I don't, funky about, okay, we really haven't managed to, like, before the thing even comes out, I mean, it's still over two weeks away, and before it even comes out, they're they're saying, okay, uh, you know, like, the Steam Controller is not everything we wanted it to be, but we want you guys to help us out. We want you guys to help us out and make it better. It's like, you know, send me a free one, <clears throat> and I'll tell you all the ways you can make it better. But don't ask well, me to Well, so that's, buy that's the weird double-edged sword, Brent, because we all get annoyed, like... You know, Apple puts out a new phone, or everybody does, not just Apple. I'm just using it as an example. Puts out a new phone when they know that six months from now they're going to put out the same phone with, like, three tweaks and a 16 extra gigabytes. And, you know, they're going to charge you extra for it or whatever. And so, you know, we want them to be honest with us about their plans. But then they're honest with us about their plans. And we're like, well, fuck you for telling us that it's not, that you're going to put out another one. But at the same time, I do feel, 
it does feel weird to say pay full price. Like if it was a thirty dollar controller, mm-hmm. like hey, let's put this out at thirty bucks uh, and, and see what people put ten thousand of them out there for free or whatever, and let people iterate on them and let's see what happens. But selling it at I mean that's a full price controller, obviously. Oh, yeah. um, knowing that again, it's probably going to be a second version in six months. I just don't. I, I might as well wait. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, if if Valve was if Valve was acting like they were completely confident in this and. And I, I, I don't, you know, they were just big dick swinging with it. I, I don't know if I would be more or less annoyed because you're right. I mean, it, it is sort of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. I mean, if, but I mean, what it ultimately boils down to though is that if the controller worked, none of this would be happening. If the controller actually did what it was supposed to do, what they, what Valve set out to do with it, this conversation wouldn't be happening. You know, so that that's ultimately the thing. I think that what it ultimately boils down to is the controller is fucked. And whether or not Valve acknowledges it's fucked or doesn't acknowledge it's fucked, it doesn't change the fundamental fact that it is fucked and fuck them for it. I really, I got, I got nothing else here. Like, like I, I really have run out of steam at this point. Th- oh no, I didn't mean to say that. Damn it! Damn it! Damn it! Let's move on, Lawrence. Let's still talk about something PC related. I think that this is kind of, I don't know, this is. Well, this is shitty. This is something else I want to complain about, basically. But <laughs> <laughs> NVIDIA <laughs> has announced that... This is like the old Jewish grandmother of gaming shows. <laughs> and then... And then... They turn the air conditioning on. So NVIDIA has announced that their game-ready drivers for their GeForce graphics cards are only going to be available... And I can't. I can't remember when this th- this starts. This is this is either this is now or this is happening soon. But Nvidia is going to move their game ready drivers so that you can only get them through the GeForce Experience Nvidia app on the PC. And this is horseshit. All right. Well, wait. Not just. Not only just through the the Nvidia Experience GeForce app, which I use, Brent. But I, I you have to be two. logged in with an account. Yeah. Uh, okay, okay. Which I am not. So you have to. You have to. Essentially, you have to give them your email. All right. Which which is fine. Whatever. I, I mean, it, it it's a. Oh really? Because that's that's actually the part that no, bothers me. The part me. that bothers me is that the GeForce Experience app fucking sucks, and the fact that you now have to use it in order to install their game ready apps bugs me a little bit and I, and I use it too i mean i got the thing installed which is why i fucking hate it so much but right now you could go to nvidia's driver page and download you know like the like the star wars battlefront driver package you know it's, that's going to have all the tweaks and everything for that game to make it run the best that it can on your nvidia card you could go get that from nvidia's website if you wanted to sans email address as, as lauren is talking about but starting soon you're going to have to download the GeForce Experience app and use it. And if the GeForce Experience app didn't feel... Like, I can't tell you the number of times that the the GeForce Experience uh, capture engine has crashed and crashed my game as a result of doing that. I can't tell you the number of times it's happened. Really? That's interesting. I've, never, I've, not, had a, uh, I've not had a problem. Yes, I have had nothing but. I've had nothing but problems out of the fucking GeForce app. Um... So anyway, I don't know. I'm not a fan. I think that I think it's a little on the buggy side. And I mean, like I update the thing regularly, you know. Like I've I've done like you know like the fucking clean install and all that stuff, and you know tried. I, I mean, I've been through their fucking forums, like you know, trying to find a solution to this. But for whatever reason, either something about maybe my my hardware, or, you know, some combination of that app has crashed more games, and I, I basically have given up on using it at this point. I only use it basically to install drivers, and then I you know go into the fucking task manager and shut it all down but I, i'm not i'm not crazy about this so but i get what you're saying too that you know the fact that you have to be you have to be an nvidia citizen in good standing now in order to get the game ready drivers yeah i mean fuck that too yeah i, I don't i don't like giving out my email and for shit like this you know just to get a driver download which has been traditionally you know you pay 350 bucks or whatever you pay for their video card mm-hmm. and you know in all in all of history, you just download the drivers, and that is, a, I think, a consumer expectation. And I, you know, it's just another fucking. I'm sure it's going to turn into. Sh- you know, they're going to they use that to make money and market to you, and it's just it fucking annoys me. I, I don't disagree with you, and and it's the thing is, it's just I don't know, it's just not necessary. I mean, I don't 
I don't know what it other than direct marketing, like you're saying. I guess I guess that's the reason that they're doing it because I can't really think of I can't think of anything else about it that that would really make sense. But I guess I guess that's just what it boils down to. Yeah, probably. All right, Brent. There's something else on here that's probably going to make you happy. Well, no. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm ha- I'm happy. <laughs> happy, but not again. The, the Jewish grandmother no. of, of gaming shows. I, I'm ha- <laughs> I mean, listen. I'm happy about it, but it's probably because I don't understand it all that well. The Witcher 3 mod kit update enables new texture additions. How does that not make you happy? That's the title of this. You get new texture additions. I, I think that I think it's great. I think that it's definitely going to. Is it not far enough for you? Is that well, the... okay? No. See, here's the thing. Like again, I don't know. Like I'm talking. You know, like people are like, oh, you know, they've come up with this. They've come up with this. Uh, this new. This new kind of screw that they're going to use on all the future next generation space shuttles. It's like I don't know if I'm really qualified enough to appreciate whether that's good or bad. You know, and that's kind of how I feel about this. In that, I know that being able to add new textures is a good thing, but that they still have not pushed the Witcher three mod kit as far as the, as the red kit mod tools that existed in in the first two games. I know people are still complaining about this game, not having the same level of support for modders that the other two games did, which people are not crazy about and that it's, there's still no UI for it. And, and that CD project red has basically said, probably not going to happen so you know it's one of those things that i i guess it's a mixed bag it's like it's great that you know that they're doing this but it it really seems i don't know i guess it seems sort of uncharacteristic is the word i want to use given how highly thought of cd project red typically is particularly with pc gamers it seems like they're just making some decisions around this specific thing with the witcher 3 that i don't know I, i i I, I kind of wonder. I kind of wonder. Seem to make sense. What it is that they're thinking of it. I mean, like at this point, I'm kind of wondering, gee, why, why even do mod support at all? I mean, like I wonder if it would have been better to just not do it, or to you know to just let people do it like in a very unofficial capacity. But to kind of half-ass it this way seems to have maybe made more people. I don't know. Just made the situation a little bit more contentious than it might have been otherwise. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. I don't know, Brent. Uh, you know, I, I, I can't disagree with you uh, that it may not have been the best move to sort of half-ass it. But um, I mean, you, you know, yeah. as one of our commenters pointed out, what we advocated on EBA and what we advocate on this show is full-assing it. All right, if you're going That's to exa- do it, exactly you right. full-ass that motherfucker. That is exactly right. Uh, all right, Brent. Next up, happy birthday. Speaking of somebody who full-assed it is Nintendo. Happy birthday. That's right. On October 18th, 1985, Nintendo of America released in limited quantities the Nintendo Entertainment System, which was a big gamble at the time, because you have to remember back, this is the post-Atari crash of 1983, I guess, and video game consoles in the American market were an uncertain prospect. I guess would be the fair way to put it. And man, Nintendo yes. came in and they took they took a big gamble and completely transformed the American video game market. And really where we are sitting right now can be traced back to that I mean that was the moment where the American gamer really really got video game consoles. I mean that is that's what started the 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 whole the whole thing where we are right now. I mean, yes, there was the Atari before that. You know, there was ColecoVision. There were other consoles before that. But who knows where it would have gone if Nintendo had not come in when they did. And so, uh, I, I, but the point that I'm making is that the Nintendo Entertainment System was a great console. But I, I think it's also pretty clear that it was a pretty important console and and laid the foundation that we are standing on right now. Indeed it did, and I wish you and all of yours, Nintendo, happy birthday. I hope you're having a nice party. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, this is not a system. I'm ashamed to say this. I did not own the Nintendo Entertainment System, yep. nor did I intend. There was, I believe, a version of it that was pretty super. Uh, <laughs> I did not. Uh, uh, I actually what, played my Intellivision until... Two- show? <laughs> I played my Intellivision until 2004, so... Yeah. Uh, I don't, uh, and then I, and then I switched to the Atari 2600. 
Um, no, this is this is awesome. It's hard. It's so funny. It's hard to believe. It. To me, thirty years. It just seems like more than thirty years. It seems like so long ago that these consoles like were, laid the foundation for again what we know and and uh, we've come so far and we're on the verge of virtual reality and and uh, it's pretty impressive. You know, it, it is interesting that we're sitting here talking about this. Uh, and this is just a little personal anecdote, but um, the guy, the guy that I was friends with during during that age that actually had the Nintendo. I had the Sega Master System first, and then I got the Nintendo. Yes, I also had Sega. I got the Nintendo later. But my friend yep. Nick had the he had the Nintendo Entertainment System, and so that's really, really where I got my first taste of Nintendo. And I, I've, talked, I've talked about this on the show before, but he, he and I are the ones that like, you know, played Contra, Ad Nauseam, Excite Bike, and, and all that. I, I, like, I played The Legend of Zelda to completion on his Nintendo Entertainment System. We played Metal Gear together on his Nintendo Entertainment System. And it's interesting that we're sitting here talking about this because I've, I've, I've mentioned Nick on the show a few times, you know, sort of talking about like our formative game experiences, and I just reconnected with him on Facebook. Interestingly enough, I, I looked him up and, uh, and we've been talking and we might, uh, we might end up seeing each other around the holidays this year. He's going to be in visiting his folks. So it's just, I don't know. It's, it's just kind of interesting because I've been thinking about him lately. And of course thinking about him and in, inevitably makes me think about those early, early years playing Nintendo games. So it's just, it's, it's just a, a kind of a, a nostalgic, a happy nostalgic feeling all around for this. That's awesome. Um, all right, Brent. Also Nintendo related. I don't oh, know how yeah. we got all of our stories in twos this week. It just sort of happened. Uh, so not only is this the Jewish grandmother of game, game shows, it's also the Noah's Ark of game shows. You know, we, um, should, we should really try to turn this into a game show game show. You know what I mean? Like there ought to be. Oh, the game show of there game shows. Be like, pri- hey, that, that would be like a fucking cool a game show of game game of game shows. And it, you know, like well, there would be prizes. You'd have. Some- it's the game show of games. Show. If we could, if we could get like David Hasselhoff to host it, <laughs> oh my god, we would boost Brent. We would boost our listeners from the current listenership of fifteen to like easily forty five. That's yeah, right, forty five. Let's say mine. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we we, uh, we ought to we ought to pitch that. We we got to come up with we got to come up with uh, with like what the format would be, and of course, like you'd have to give away like new cars. But you know, like like they're all like mini, like Dodge Caravans or something. You know, like they're always useful. <laughs> But anyway, I like it. The game show of games show. I like it. Um, Let's go back to the story. For the love of God. Yes, Nintendo. Yes. Uh, Wall Street Journal had an article that Nintendo uh, NX, the Nintendo, that's a, that's a working name, yeah, right? This is like a code name for whatever it's going to be. It has to be. The Nintendo NX will be a console and a handheld with industry leading chips, Brent. So this article, uh, which is uh, originally was from uh, the Wall Street Journal and comes to us via polygon um basically says two things number one well a few things number one that nintendo has committed to talking about the nx in 2016 though that is not new uh, number two that they will have industry leading chips meaning there were complaints from the wii u that the chips even in the wii u were not competitive with their uh, uh competitors sony and xbox at the time uh, and that they needed to be creating better hardware and number three that the nintendo nx will be both a console and a handheld that you could take out on the road with you uh, and play on the road independently, and then also use with the console system. You know, I, I'm very intrigued by by that aspect of it. I, I think that I think that the there is an opportunity here. I mean, given how powerful mobile chips are, and you know, you look at you know, like every time Apple rolls out a new a new phone, they're bringing game developers up on stage to talk about the you know the power of their new integrated chips and and all the things that it, you know they can do with you know their graphics uh, engine and so forth and it, it does seem like there's a lot of raw power available in some of these off the shelf some of these off the off the shelf chips now and that a company like Nintendo could really leverage that given the fact that they have such a strong track record in handhelds given the fact that the the Wii U has has probably not been the the console that they wanted it to be I have to say that I don't like. I don't necessarily see this as an act of desperation, which I have seen. I have seen some people make comments to that effect. I don't really see it that way. I see it as Nintendo possibly zeroing in on the thing that they can do really, really well, and that everybody acknowledges they can do really, really well, but also very smartly utilize technology that's out there 
to create a game system that I think would make a lot of sense for them. And the idea, if, if this were like a Wii U that had really great, you know, HD graphics, and it was like the Wii U gamepad, and you could like play it, and it would link to the TV through something like a Steam Link or whatever, but a little box that you know that's got the HDMI port that connects to the TV. But then that same gamepad you're holding in your hand, you throw in your pocket, you walk out the door, and you keep playing the exact same game while you're out and about, and then, you know then come back. I mean, I gotta say, and given the quality, given the quality of some of the games that Nintendo has come up with, that could be. I think a, a pretty compelling experience. It's definitely something I would be excited about. I don't own the Wii U. I do have a 3DS. I love my 3DS. And I have to say that I would I would really really be intrigued to see what Nintendo would do with, you know, some sort of hybridized system and and hopefully by the time this this comes out, they will have, you know, done this whole revamp of their online system they're going to have like everything kind of kind of integrated and and it's going to work smoothly and and all that if if that happens that would just be the icing on the cake for me but i'm intrigued and mildly excited to see what they do that is i was going to say as you were speaking brent that's exactly what i was thinking uh in terms of being a gamble for them uh what i was going to say to you and then you eventually did get to it which is that idea of imagine you were playing whatever assassin's creed fallout 4 whatever and they could take that actual game with you. Uh, that, that to me, is, is an actual game changer. Um, yeah. it, it, I mean, that literally, like, that's something that I'm not a Nintendo fan. I have no interest in Nintendo. But obviously, the Wii U has most of, I believe, the major games, you know, uh, that are out there. Not all of them, but most of them. And I think if, if they were to create something like this, I would, that would be very, very interesting to me, the idea that I could take those games and go mobile with them. I wish Nintendo the best. I really, I really do like the video game industry with them in it more than I think I would like it than if they went the way of Sega. I don't want that to happen. So I hope that they are able to find something that really works for what they want to do as a game company and that people really get excited about. And I think this might be on the right track. We'll see. Yeah, I agree. It's interesting. So last up, Brent, in the garage, Mm -hmm. in the very large garage this week. Somber. uh, Is this a somber story? It, it is a somber story, but I'm actually intrigued for you to tell me why it's news. Well, I guess really, <laughs> I, I guess really more what it is, it's just, it's sort of the, the, the reckoning. It is the, the recognition that the reckoning, the, the event has finally happened that Hideo Kojima has in fact departed Konami. Of course, this is not a surprise to any of us, but the New Yorker reports that October 9th was Kojima's last day at Konami, citing anonymous sources who attended a a farewell party at uh, Kojima Productions. And, um, and that he's, he's officially out. He's officially out and moved on. And I don't know. It, it is really, it really is the end of an era. And I have to say that as I've been playing Metal Gear Solid five quite a bit lately, and as I'll be talking about a little bit more in just a second, it has really been on my mind lately, like what this guy has has created in the way of a legacy for this particular game franchise and then for himself also. And I gotta say that something about something about him him leaving at this point, it really is I don't know, it really has kind of left a mark on me. I mean, this guy has really, really done something wholly unique in gaming. He and I was thinking, you know, just recently about the original Metal Gear on the NES, like we were just talking about, and what a profound experience that was way back in the day. And you can kind of see the vision that he's had, that he's obviously been trying to, you know, to get out through all these different permutations. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I've I've definitely got like sort of a mixed history with Kojima and my, my level of appreciation for his work, but him leaving Konami, I, I got to say it's it's stirred it's stirred a bit of something in me, and I, I'm I'm kind of sorry that things have gone the way they have. Uh, indeed, I, you know, I, I'm not. This doesn't resonate with me in the way it resonates with you, obviously, Brent. I've not I haven't felt particularly close necessarily to uh, Kojima's um, 
games in, in the past, but uh, I do certainly, uh, obviously, you know, know and respect him as a an icon in the industry. And uh, while this does not come as a surprise, it does sort of put a nail in the coffin. But I have to say, as somebody who's not necessarily been um, an ardent follower, supporter of his over the years, I, I am very interested to see what he does after separating himself from Konami uh, and see if maybe this doesn't uh, open up some new creative avenues in his, his life. And hopefully he can continue to bring us more amazing, amazing games. Well, I can, I can say with confidence that given how hugely successful Metal Gear Solid Five has been and the fact that he's a free agent now, I would say Kojima can pretty much do whatever the fuck he wants at this point. Whatever that is, oh, yeah. I don't know. And I don't know if I would necessarily be interested in it, but uh, I, I would say that he's got carte blanche to pretty much write his own ticket from uh, at least from this point moving forward. So it will be interesting to see what he does. All right, everybody, uh, we are going to skip the clubhouse and go straight to the road this evening and uh, talk a little bit about the games we've been playing, but. If- course first we will visit the poll results from last week's discussion topic lauren would you care to share those absolutely brent so the conversation we had last week was about jim sterling's uh video concerning aggressive apathy and you asked the question to the community what's your take on jim sterling's rant concerning aggressive apathy and here's how it shook out coming in in last place with eight percent of the vote it's already here and there's nothing we will do to change it especially criticizing gamers uh, coming in in second place with 10% of the vote. I don't think it's as terrible as he thinks. Pick your battles. Coming in at 26% of the vote. I agree, but it's impossible not to get fatigued by the constant shenanigans. And with 56% of the vote, he's right. We have to keep up the pressure constantly. And he's talking, of course, about uh, you know the cons- constant DLC and pre-ordering all the things that we don't like and, and how he gets yelled at for talking about them over and over and over. And I personally would agree, Brent. I say we keep talking about it until something changes for the better. All right, and there you have it. Thank you very much, everybody, for sounding off and voting in the poll and letting your thoughts be known. We appreciate that, as always. Absolutely, we do. All right, Brent, so let's talk about what we're playing this week. Brent, yeah. uh, I had a very odd week this week, and I can't, I don't believe I, I'm going to say this, but I don't think I played a game this you week. You didn't play even a little bit of Rocket League? I didn't play. I know I don't. I played no games this week at all. I had. I just had a crazy week at work, and I was working late all week and uh, up early and all that stuff. And so I did not play this week. Uh, I watched about twenty hours of Assassin's Creed videos, <laughs> if that counts. But uh, uh, and and really just the same sections of the game over and over and over again. That almost, that almost uh, but, sounds like a uh, form of torture utilized by the Spanish Inquisition. I did. I did not play a game. So it's just going to be you this week, Brent, talking about. A game that I believe you've played a little bit of over the last few weeks, Metal Gear Solid 5. Yeah, Metal Gear Solid 5 is, is the game that keeps on giving. And the thing that I want to talk about specifically in relation to Metal Gear Solid 5 this week is how how the game keeps managing to reinvent itself and re, reinvest me in it. I, I, when I, I finished Chapter 1, for a couple of days, I, I dabbled. I, I played just a little bit, but really, I'd kind of lost the... The, the thirst to play that I previously was experiencing. And I thought, well, gee, maybe, maybe I've hit that. Maybe I've hit that kind of time limit. Like we've, we've talked about with games, right? that crucial, that, that tipping point after 700 yeah. hours when you don't want to play a game <laughs> yeah, anymore. Exactly. But you know, we've talked about hitting that point where even though you might not be done with the game, you are kind of done with the game. You've kind of reached a point of saturation where you just don't need to go back to it. Yep. Particularly, obviously, particularly in open world games. And I, I was, I was beginning to wonder if maybe I'd hit that. Like maybe chapter one had given me everything I needed from Metal Gear Solid five, but I am back in it full force at this point. And really what it comes down to is the, the combination of crafting and weapon customization in the, in the game and then also some of the new things that have been introduced in in chapter two. So as an example, they're now starting to they're now starting to throw out missions. So it, it's it's like a mission from chapter one where we want you to go to this base and we want you to disable communications equipment. But the change this time is that it is all procurement on site. You have to get all of your weapons and equipment from the field. You don't take anything with you except the binoculars and uh, and your Fulton rig. So you can extract people, but that's it. 
and, and just the base level prosthetic arm. And so it really, it was really challenging. I mean, it was really challenging because I play, I play stealth most of the time and not having a tranquilizer gun. Of course, you know, none of the fucking Russian soldiers are carrying tranquilizer guns. So not having those things, it really profoundly affected my play style and my strategy. Not having the night vision uh, changes, you know, how you, how you have to go about doing things. And, uh, you know, do, do you wait for daytime when you have better visibility? But, of course, you have to be a lot more careful because they have better visibility, too, and all of that stuff. It, it really created this, this interesting new kind of mix. And uh, there was another there was another mission that's that's a replay from an earlier one that's now an extreme difficulty mode. Uh, you know, there's missions where you have to you have to have complete stealth. I mean, like if if the enemy sees you, like there's no reflex mode. The enemy sees you, game over, restart, and like that's the only option. And, you know, so just things like that. And but it's been fun. Like it's been it's been a lot of fun to I, I make a lot of those challenge kind of things for myself. But it's cool to have the game, uh, to have the game throw those things into the mix. I, I find it pretty invigorating. The other thing, like I was talking about, is the weapon customization stuff. And I've really been getting into this lately and, and kind of exploring some of some of the weapon options that I've not really paid much attention to prior to now. And I got into this whole thing uh, with undermounts for my assault rifles. So I, I eventually got to this tier in the assault rifle that I was using where you have an undermount option. And you know, that could just be like a grip, which they say, I don't, you know, it increases stability while firing and moving, but it also means that you can add attachments to it. So you can do as an example, like a grenade launcher, the noob tube. Yeah. And so you can, uh, you can throw a grenade launcher on the bottom of it, or you can throw a shotgun. And I was reading that, that you could also do certain pistols. And I'd be like, why the fuck would you, like, why would you want to have a pistol on a, on a bottom of an assault rifle? Like, what kind of sense would that make? And so I was doing some reading, just trying to figure out, like, well, okay, which, which weapons can you put into an undermount? And I read, somebody online was talking about how they were using a non-lethal assault rifle, like one of the stun, the stun assault rifles. And the, but then they had a, they had a, 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 a lethal handgun on the undermount, they were saying that basically they had like a completely non-lethal loadout, but they had the handgun on the undermount just in case they needed to kill somebody or wanted to or whatever. And so that led down like this whole chain of like, you know, gee, I really had never, like it had never really occurred to me to have a non-lethal assault rifle because I've got the, the trank gun, uh, the handgun, and I've also got a trank sniper rifle. So what, you know, why would I need it? And it was just one of those things I kind of filed away, like, oh, well, I guess, you know, that's interesting. Maybe I'll develop that, that non-lethal assault rifle at some point. But one day, yeah. what, what kind of set this whole thing off and got me moving along this path is that I unlocked the water gun. <laughs> I unlocked the water pistol, which uh, you, you do this mission at some point. You help some kids out. And as a result of, as a result of uh, that, that sequence of events, you get the ability to develop a squirt gun, basically. And I just thought, like, I, it was like, <laughs> like, it was a joke, you know, like it was a joke. It, it costs like, I don't know, like 7,000 GMP to develop. You know, most of those guns are like hundreds of thousands of GMP. So I'm like, ah, you know, what? Right. like, it's just like a little gag in the game serves no purpose. I developed the, you know, the squirt gun. I equipped it at one point, squirt, squirt. Okay. Yeah. Fun. But when I was doing some reading online, I read a reference to somebody talking about, they were talking about disabling electronics equipment and they're like, yeah, you know, like usually. Usually I just, I just, you know, we'll, we'll do C4 and, you know, set off the alert. But if I'm really trying to be stealth, I'll use the squirt gun. I'm like, what What the fuck does that mean? And it suddenly kind of went off of like, short out you're like going to squirt like the electronics equipment is going to like short out and fry. And so like, I try it, like I go on right. a mission, I, I get the squirt gun and I'm like, you know, I'm squirting it like this communication rig or whatever. And it's like not doing anything. And I'm like, oh, what the fuck is he talking about? And then I'm looking at the thing. I'm like, well, it does have like this ventilation grill here on the side. And so like I aim specifically at the little ventilation slits and squirt. And it, does, it just immediately like, <laughs> and up, like you're kidding me. <laughs> now, you have to be careful. Like if there's a guard standing right, right close to it, they will hear, they will hear it, you know, fry and they'll, 
they'll immediately assume it's enemy sabotage and go into an alert right. status. So you have to be you have to be uh, careful with it, but you can stealthily take out their gear as opposed to using grenades or C4 or something like that, where they're definitely going to hear you doing it. And so now I'm going around with a squirt gun, you know, so I can be all stealthy and, you know, take out their, their power subsystems and things like that. But the thing is, it really changes my loadout because I no longer have the tranquilizer pistol, which I use heavily. And I finally right. got the tranquilizer pistol. That's got the, like the increased penetration that you can take out light bulbs with. And so now I've got the squirt gun instead. And, so it's different. Like you really have to be like you go into reflex mode now. Uh, you know, like if somebody sees you, you got to have you got to have another weapon equipped because turning around on them and hitting with that squirt gun is not going to do a whole lot of good. <laughs> but it's just led me down like this whole chain. So like now what I want to do is like I'm going to have the squirt gun. So now what I want to do is I want to develop a, a suppressed non-lethal assault rifle that uses like rubber bullets. And I've got I've got the the rifle itself. I've I've got maybe three tiers of it built up, but the the fourth tier is the one that adds the suppressor option. All right. And so I'm like like my intel team has to level up one more. Like if they're fifty two, they have to be fifty three or something like that in order to unlock that. And like I'm waiting on that to happen. And then I'm going to switch to this non lethal assault rifle, and that'll kind of become like my mainstay. But it's just it like these kinds of things are what is keeping me excited in the game. And of course, you know, I got to go out into the field and use this stuff. And of course, I've got to, you know, recruit more guys to level up my my intel team and all that. And so it's just this big cycle that keeps working to to keep me interested in the game. That's awesome, man! Didn't when you when you talked about this? I can't remember now if it was last week or the week before. When did you switch over to chapter two? Uh, last week, I think, was when I talked about finishing. Was chapter it last week? One. Yeah. And the response on the website, if I recall correctly, was somewhat. Tepid. So I was curious to see how whether you know how you would continue to enjoy episode two. That's awesome, man. Thus far, I really like it, but I like it for different reasons. Of course, now, but the, here's the right, thing to remember, yeah. though. But that's kind of the point. Yeah, yeah no? it is. But also, the I thing mean, to remember is that a, a couple people, you know, did tell me that they're like, well, the story is, you know, the story is much stronger in chapter one. And honestly, it was like I could give a shit about the story. I mean, like I'm not playing this fucking game for the story. I'm really not. It, 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 right. It's one of the few games that I am. I am really playing purely for the gameplay purely for the joy of the game mechanics. And I have to say that the story, not to say that there's not interesting things that have happened, things that have, you know, kind of reignited my imagination for the whole kind of mythos and the legacy of big boss and how that folds into the timeline and eventually, you know, becomes the first metal gear on the NES, all that stuff. I mean, I, I have an appreciation for that, but it's completely secondary to the experience of playing. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I'm glad you're having such a great time with it. Now, actually 700 hours yes. in. <laughs> it's got it's probably All close right, to let's, two. Uh, it's probably close to 2 at this point. Ooh, let's uh let's head out into the sunset, Brent. My into the sunset uh comes from one of our listeners down in Argentina. Yep. Who uh who I speak with from time to time and he contacted me to tell me about something that I don't think he realized was as near and dear to my heart as it actually is. And that was that a friend of his created the Shining Experience on the Oculus Rift, which has full DK2 support. This Oculus Shining Experience does. Uh, I am a huge, huge fan of the Shining. Um, I am from Colorado. I proposed to my wife at the hotel in Estes Park, the Stanley Hotel, where Stephen King was inspired and wrote some of the Shining. Um uh, it is a, uh, uh, a movie that I absolutely love. And so I actually was really hoping that there would be a shining experience at some point. Now, right now it's just of, uh, Danny riding around in the big wheel on the floor of the hotel. Uh, someday I hope that somebody recreates the entire hotel from the Stanley Kubrick movie, uh, for you to play around in, but it's really cool. I encourage you guys, if you have a, uh, um, an Oculus Rift to check this out. And even if you don't, I encourage you to check out the linked, uh, trailer to the Shining Experience. It's very, very cool. Now, does does the Shining Experience does it like take into account? Did you watch Room Two Three Seven? Have we talked about that? The documentary about I did watch about yep. all the conspiracy theories. I, I've that? I've stayed in Room Two Three Seven. By the really? way, at, at, at the yeah at the Stanley, at the Stanley Hotel, or the Overlook, the Stanley. No, at the okay, Stanley. Gotcha. Um, the actual room. The actual room that that uh, well, does, yes. I thought that I thought that originally it was like Room like One Eight Three, and Kubrick changed it for. For the movie. No. 
No, it was. I think it was two three seven. Well, no, no, it's, it's two, two three, three seven four, in the movie. But I thought in the I, no, no, no. I'm I saying in the book, no, no. It was but a I think room. no. It's a second floor room, and it's either two three seven or two three four. I can't remember. But yeah. yeah. Anyway, but the point is that um, you know one of the things they talk about that documentary is how like during like Danny's tricycle ride sequences, there's like some mm-hmm. of like the impossible architecture of the hotel. Uh, yes, yes, you know, be- becomes apparent, and and like the way that you'll see things in places as he's riding that that you know based on other geography in the film they're not supposed to be there and stuff like that i was just i was wondering if the uh if the, if the oculus experience takes any of that stuff into account like the impossible elevator and everything like you know like there's like where the elevators are in the film there can't be elevators there because there's supposed to be a window there and stuff like right, that right right yeah I, 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 don't, I don't know i didn't actually check the details to that degree mm. few people few people have and that's probably that's probably healthy it's probably best that they don't Probably still, still very cool. Check it out. <laughs> My uh, end of the sunset is not game related this week, but it's just one of those one of those cool things that I never really thought would happen. But uh, there's a band called Ghost, which you might know as Ghost BC, but their their actual name is Ghost. Ghost BC is just it's like some thing they had to do for like legal copyright reasons in the states. They they were known as Ghost BC, but anyway, there's this band called ghost which I, I guess for lack of for lack of a better uh of, of a better way to describe them i i think most people describe them as like a swedish black metal band but uh they have a very kind of retro inspired inspired sound like, like they, they certainly are like a metal band but it, it's more like that kind of like level of aggression and and metal that you would have expected from i don't know like maybe the 70s is an example their vocalist who's really good, but you know, like sings clean vocals, which is not the, the most common style you would see in this genre. But anyway, they're, they're fantastic. Like I'm a really big fan. I love what they've done with metal as kind of like an art performance sort of thing. They have like a very cool aesthetic quality. Their lead singer dresses like a satanic Pope and they are the most (laughs) unlikely band to play on national television here on the states but it is happening motherfuckers because ghost is going to be on the Stephen colbert show october 30th uh you know celebration of halloween and i I could not be more excited like it just it blows my mind (laughs) that this band is going to be on broadcast television in the u.s i really i could never have imagined or predicted that this would come about, but uh, I guess I'm not the only person who's getting into him. So, anyway, uh, if you're a fan of Ghost, look for him on the Stephen Colbert show coming up very soon. Very cool. All right. So, uh, in our ride along this week, we have uh, listener Unicorn Commando. Unicorn Commando. Uh, and Unicorn Commando writes the following Hello, Divine Leaders. <laughs> I assume he's referring to. Someone other than us. My ride-along is regarding the continuation of product add-ons far after the title game has been released. A fine example of this is Battlefront 4. Since its initial release, it has been getting updates, fixes, and even additional content. Most recent being the Night Operations Community Add-on for free, in capital letters. And another soon to be released. This kind of consumer care should be extended across the board to more developers and creators to not only attract more consumer base, but to also keep longevity of its product going. I found myself playing Battlefield again because of this and was very happy with everything that has been added on to it. On a side note, season passes. Many people have been rather annoyed with these, and I am an individual who finds them to be a great choice. Pay individually when they arrive and pay the original cost, or buy the season pass and get them all the content for one-time fee at a reduced cost if you were to buy them all separately. Great strategy. So, uh, Brent, I thought this was uh, uh, particularly germane. I thought so. First of all, I think it's a very interesting uh, uh, comment, and uh, certainly, you know, season passes. One of the few things, you know, that you actually get a discount if you do buy them all together. Free, very frequently, uh, they're not offering any discounts. Where, like, if you buy a season pass in the game together, uh, and so if you know you want something, season passes are a good way to go. Increasingly lately, and this drives me absolutely batshit crazy. People are selling like Battlefront. They're selling season passes without detailing the content which is just absolutely fucking insane to me but the really the really interesting part of this or what I well the reason I pulled this out Brent uh, was this idea of of continually updating with free updates and then I'm not suggesting that um games should should only do free updates and that they shouldn't have paid DLC but how uh doing free updates and and GTA online with the low riders add on and the shops and missions and all that 
uh, increases the longevity of the product and increases player buy-in and loyalty to the brand. And I, I agree with uh, Unicorn Commando. I think it's a fantastic idea. Well, you know, it's one of those things that I, I think I think when it's leveraged correctly, I do think that it can really add something. And I remember I remember Daniel always talking. About, he would he would always talk about how important timing is, like prom night, and how timing the release of things like this really made made it was it was a make or break situation for him and he would talk about how if you if you time the release of these kinds of updates and and things they will have that kind of reinvigorating effect that I was just talking about with Metal Gear where it's it comes along at just the right time just as you're beginning to wane a little bit just as the game is starting to maybe get a little bit boring for you this comes along and re-energizes you and gets you right back into it and gives you reason to play. Now, obviously, it's talking about Battlefield 4, which has been out for a really long time, but I, I think that that is the goal. It, hopefully, you know that, that that is the goal is to get you re-energized and, and back into the game and really excited to play again. And I, I, I definitely appreciate the fact when they do it with, with non-paid updates, but if the content is worth paying for, you know, I don't mind paying for it. I didn't mind paying for you know, the, the Undead Nightmare DLC for, for Red Dead. I didn't mind paying for the GTA 4 paid DLC expansions, you know, that they put out for it. I'll, I'll pay for quality. If, if I'm going to get something worthwhile for my money, I don't mind paying for it, I think, which is basically what you're saying. It's just, I think that, you know, people are upset when they're asked to pay for something that they don't feel they're getting their money out of. Or, like, they're being asked to pay for just a question mark. You know, give us your money and we promise it'll be worth it when you get it. And I, I'm not as enthusiastic about paying for mystery boxes. Obviously. Yes, that's true. All right. Uh, with that, Brent, I think we're going to call it a show as usual. We want our listeners to sound off on everything we talked about this week, including our ride along from unicorn commando, uh, Brent's announcement of his good friends. <laughs> yes. Ghost, yes. My, coming my to good late show with Stephen friends. Colbert. That's right. Uh, the shining experience, metal gear, solid five. And of course, what we talked about while we were up in the garage, uh, Hideo Kojima's final departure from Konami, the Nintendo NX, the Nintendo Entertainment System's 30th birthday, the Witcher 3 mod kit, NVIDIA's game-ready drivers being locked behind GeForce Experience, uh, Valve and their desire to improve the Steam controller by having you improve it for them, Steam hardware uh, not being Mac compatible, Fallout 4, and its PlayStation remote for Vita play specific controls, the Pip Boy edition, which is there and now it's gone. Maybe it'll be there again. Who knows? Uh, Star Wars Battlefront multiplayer modes, GTA Online, Low Riders, and Rocket League Back to the Future Car Pack coming out Wednesday, October 21st, 2015. We want to hear your thoughts about all of those topics and anything else related to gaming. As usual, he is Brent Adams. I am Lauren Baumgarten. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old, you get old because you stop playing. 